Um, good morning, again. I am Saksham Nijhavan from Forum for the Future, but I also represent the Responsible Energy Initiative. Um, we are very happy to host all of you for the first Responsible Renewable Energy Summit. Um, we are humbled by the turnout today. Um, it's, like I said, it's always a great problem to have when you've got a lot of people because there's a lot to learn today. Um, and I hope you will find the discussions today insightful and um, inspiring. Before we begin, may I please request you to put your mobile phones on silent if you haven't. Just take 10 seconds to just check if your mobile phones are on silent. If you would like to take a phone call, please uh, go uh, to the back side and behind the doors and there's a lot of space for you to take your phone calls. Uh, please feel free to do so if you've got urgent work. Um, we've confirmed with the venue team there are no fire drills planned for today. So if you hear a fire alarm, follow the fire exit signs towards the fire exit doors. There is an open area towards the right side if you face the back um, where the lunch will be served. That's another area for you to gather in case there is a fire alarm as well. If, you've, if there's any other emergency, we've got um, the organizing team or you can contact the venue team uh, being led by Rajendra. There is an ambulance on call here 24 seven. So just in case there's an emergency, please let us know uh, as well. Moving on to the summit today. Uh, in the summit today, we will have three panel discussions and a few keynote speeches um, as well. Um, we will start with a welcome note and an, ad, uh, and an expert note, and then we'll move on to the first panel discussion that focuses on the role of investment in driving um, responsible renewable energy and raising the ambition of the sector. After the first panel discussion, we will have the keynote speech from Mr. Rajnath Ram from Niti Aayog um, around 12 o'clock. And then we'll move on to the second panel discussion that will discuss um, how do we uh, cite renewable energy in a more responsible manner on low impact siting and responsible land use as well. Lunch will be served around 1.30 p.m. We'll have a full hour for all of us to have lunch and network with each other. And we've got something really exciting in store for you during lunch as well. Post lunch, we will have um, the third panel discussion that will uh, explore how we might embed circularity in the renewable energy sector as it's growing. I hope you'll stay here for the entire, du entire duration. Um, each of the discussions, each of the speeches will bring a unique perspective um, to the incredibly promising and rapidly growing RE sector here. I'm sure all of us are proponents of renewable energy. I'm sure all of us want to see India decarbonize and be on a low economic, uh, low carbon economy pathway. And our effort here is to ensure that it is done in a responsible manner and that we can set a benchmark together as the RE sector. <clears throat> in the conference today, we are actively trying to reduce the waste we generate through this summit. Hence, you will not see any flex or single use plastics. Um, Please use the QR codes on your table to scan and it will take you to a folder that has the agenda and some reading materials. But if you've registered, we'll also make sure we'll send these to you over email afterwards as well. With that, I would now like to invite Dr. Annapurna Vancheswaran for the opening address. Dr. Annapurna is the Managing Director of the Nature Conservancy India. Over the last 30 years, Dr. Annapurna has worked extensively in sustainable development and climate change, and has built numerous strategic partnerships that are driving climate action. She's worked in various capacities with international, national, and subnational governments, private sector, and community organizations on ground. Dr. Annapurna, I'd like to welcome you to the stage now. Thank you so much, uh, Saksham. Um, and I think now I need to know that I should not let my colleagues in my office to give you a CV of mine. So, but I am delighted, he said it would be the opening address, but I would like to welcome you all to this first Renewable Energy Summit and glad to have you all join us this morning. I see a lot of young faces and um, I think I'm delighted to see this young faces because you are the future that we are all talking about and we will be discussing the entire day today. Why is responsible renewable energy so important? Well, when we hear 
from the set of experts today, which have been gathered, and I'm so glad to see some of the people that I know from the energy sector. It's been delightful that we are all connecting after a little bit of COVID times and, uh, and times when I was detached. So I'm really happy and delighted to be here. But we are, the, as Ms. Saksham talked about, the panel discussions, they are so full of in information that I think the young minds who are sitting at the back would definitely enjoy looking at it. But before I welcome you, I welcome you all, but I would also like to thank Forum for the Future, Vasudha Foundation, the National Solar Energy Federation of India, Climate Trends, and of course, my organization, the Nature Conservancy, to have managed to have set up this platform today for all of us. The key questions in the panel discussions uh, the summit will attempt to explore are how do we ensure the development of RE to be in sync with the environment and social well-being? The Nature Conservancy looks at nature and people together. So this is a very important aspect for us as we move ahead. Will renewable energy support natural ecosystems, thereby building resilient communities is again something the panel would be looking at. How do we embed circularity? Because when you look at renewable energy, you also see that how do we see that the value chains uh, move ahead in a manner which is sustainable as India forges ahead and has an ambition of its own? And how do we ensure investments are equitable in the system? So these were the three pronged strategy that was planned for and I hope we will have answers at the end of the day for us to move forward. As Saksham mentioned to us, uh, the, the Responsible Energy Initiative, it is a consortium involving institutions like the Forum for the Future, Terry, whom I've known and I've been with them for three decades, the WWF, WRI, and of course, Business and Human Rights Resource Center. And all of them seek all the above that we are going to be discussing today. But scaling renewable energy is critical for this country. We all know there is no doubt about it. We aim to transition to a low carbon economy and becoming net zero by 2070. That's our ambition. Hence, the transition from renewable energy to responsible energy is the key as we move ahead. As we know, the conflict between land and green energy has become evident, but the good news, we do have good news here, that there are options and solutions available for us. And as very clearly we say that a TNC study that suggested that degraded wasteland with low biodiversity and livelihood value and converted lands across India has a potential for almost four times the RE target that we have, which has been 500 gigawatts. And this commitment that was there in COP26 can very easily be realized. So we don't have, uh, we have solutions with us. I don't know many of you would be aware of the site right tool that the TNC has developed, uh, where it is created to identify areas where solar and wind development is like, less likely to encounter social and ecological conflicts. So we already have a tool with us which can make this, uh, which can provide impetus to all the work that, uh, that we aim. The need of the R is in developing and adapting innovative technologies to minimize the impact of renewable energy projects on land use. We have an opportunity again in hand in repurposing land. So we do have solutions with us. The redevelopment and repurposing of abandoned mining lands for renewable energy development is an example. I would not go into figures because I have experts here, but uh, as it said, that even if we use 30% of this land which can be repurposed, which can be done very easily, we can get about 25 to 30 gigawatts of solar energy by 2030. So that's again something that we should look and ponder about. Thus, prioritizing these low impact land parcels 
for RE development would need the, need, need the necessary impetus by thought leadership that is in this room, by governments, both center and the state, and international uh, institutions. And hence, I think it is important that this summit manages to, at the hope, and I, and I hope at the end of it, it manages to come out with a call of action in building I India, which is powered by clean and green energy, and also ensuring that there is a thriving biodiversity in the country with harmony of people and nature. With this, may I welcome you all again, and I look forward to a very exciting deliberation the entire day. Thank you, Sachin. Thank you, Dr. Annapurna, for sharing your perspective, for setting the ambition for the day, and for also speaking about the opportunity and the need for responsible land use as part of RE development. I would now like to welcome Bharat Jairaj, who is the Executive Director Initiative Team. Bharat is, um, leads, Bharat leads the energy program at WRI in India which seeks to inform and catalyze India's transition to clean energy. He also leads WRI's energy governance practice, which focuses on uh, the intersection of energy, governance, and socioeconomic development. Bharat has also recently been appointed to the UNDP's Global Advisory Group on Energy Governance. Bharat, over to you and I'll welcome you. <coughs> This is the uh, first uh, uh, responsible renewable energy summit. Um, uh, the initiative itself, uh, we've heard uh, Sakshin talk about, uh, is now three, three and a half years old. Um, it, it, it was aimed as a, as a multi-year program. Be as a sector. Um, the idea is to ensure that renewable energy in India achieves its full potential and creates value in a way that is ecologically safe, respects rights, and is socially just. Um, and this collaborative initiative, um, you know, again, would, would economize uh, and only put up four. If you were to click it, open it up to download. Uh, the idea is that that's the kind of challenge we're trying to deal with. No one organization, no one entity, no one country can solve this. It's going to need collaboration and across just think tanks and so on. It's going to need private sector, it's going to need investors, it's going to need government to step up. Um, and I'm grateful uh, that we already have, uh, we have benefited as the Responsible Energy Initiative. There's a, an initial cohort of about 25 renewable energy companies and investors and so on who have stepped up. We've also had uh, what we call equity voices um, some of them working in uh, in some society organizations who've also volunteered their time to try and make this a really robust uh, and uh, informed uh, and inclusive uh, community. Now, um, we all know uh, that, uh, we all know of India's you know, high renewable energy targets uh, uh, from the 20 gigawatts by 2020. That was our original goal, right? Uh, we thought 20 gigawatts by 2020 itself seemed daunting at a certain point. Uh, and quickly it was increased to 175 gigawatts by uh, end of 22. Now, you know, we've pushed all those ambitions aside and we are uh, aiming at 450, 500 gigawatts uh, by the end of, uh, uh, of, uh, of 2030. 
Um, the uh, recent budget announcements um, with a focus on green growth and especially the budget allocation for, for battery storage uh, and other aspects of, of, of the energy transition uh, continue to address some of these different pieces that are going to be necessary for India to move uh, towards the energy transition. But let's not kid ourselves. This transition is not going to be easy. It has no transition is linear. Uh, we will see us ourselves take a few steps forward, some steps back, uh, some steps to the side, and so on. That's the nature of transitions. And unfortunately, there is no playbook. There is no uh, one playbook that somebody else has done that we just have to take and copy. Uh, we will all need to find our own ways uh, through this transition. But the destination is clear, the targets are clear, and the journey is well underway. Now, importantly, the renewable energy, uh, uh, the rise of renewable energy uh, has brought great hope for our ability to address climate change. India's climate strategy uh, is significantly an energy strategy, uh, and the transition away from uh, high fossil fuel dependence clearly brings substantial benefits, not just in terms of reducing emissions, but also uh, in terms of energy security. Um, and though these benefits are substantial, virtually no sector is yet universally sustainable in its impact. Some years ago, uh, we started noticing that the renewable energy sector was actually far less developed than other sectors in managing environmental and social uh, impacts that they caused across the value chain. Now, as, an, as, as organizations interested in the energy transition, we were also concerned if we should highlight this, we should talk about this too much. Uh, will, if, we had, if we talked about this, would it actually uh, cause the sector to slow down, right? Uh, would, it, would it actually add fuel <laughs> to the fossil fuel sector, right? These are questions we had. But very quickly, uh, we realized and acknowledge the larger responsibility that we have, uh, that um, we needed to ask these questions because there's real opportunity of doing this right. Um, so while the sector grows, it must adopt environmental and social safeguards. Uh, after all, renewable energy uh, is and will continue to be uh, very important for the future of this country uh, and the globe. So with our co-partners, Terry and uh, Forum for the Future, we established the Responsible Energy Initiative to begin a more serious uh, conversation around these issues. And very quickly, more partners came on board. Um, and in February 2021, we published uh, a report titled Renewable Energy to Responsible Energy. We said RE should not just stand for renewable energy. It must stand for responsible energy. Um, and this report, which was published along with WWF India and Landesa, uh, provided evidence and examples where renewable energy uh, produced low carbon energy, but uh, it had also and was causing significant land, water use impacts, had significant implications on forests, uh, biodiversity, as well as on labor and human rights. Several of these impacts are complex and importantly are not restricted to the renewable energy sector alone. But instead of seeing this as a limiting factor, we saw this as an opportunity, an opportunity for the renewable energy sector to take the lead. And indeed, through the course of this work over the last three years, um, several renewable energy sector leaders, investors in these companies, other stakeholders, have agreed that it is now time to move away from the sort of reactive stance that sectors tend to take on these issues to a more proactive stance that systematically identifies and manages social and environmental impacts. Now, without addressing these, the sector is at risk of creating a constituency of people and communities who are not in support of this sector. Not because they don't want India to go down the road of clean energy or, or to transition to a clean energy future, but because the way we are going about it is causing irre irretrievable damage to their lives, their livelihoods, and the ecosystems they live in. And, and that's why it's very important for us to prioritize the way we go about the, uh, the energy transition. So to take us one step further, after the report, we, uh, along with this cohort of 25 plus renewable energy companies and investors, researchers, and so on, we developed a set of principles, uh, what we call the Renewable Energy Initiative Principles, and these were launched last year. 
Um, the principles are pretty straightforward. The first one talks about protecting, restoring, and nurturing resilient, thriving ecological systems. I think Dr. Anapurna also alluded to this. Um, the second principle is around resilient communities. And the third is around promoting universal labor, land, and human rights. And the fourth is a commitment to participatory governance. Now, these may sound like, you know, mother, motherhood and apple pie kind of lofty universal values, but that's what we need. That's what we need to set us for ourselves as a sector to move forward. Because for this energy transition to succeed, um, we will need to ensure it is socially just and environmentally benign and inclusive. And over the past few months, we have attempted to convert these principles into uh, specific pilot projects. So what does this mean, inclusive workforce? What does this mean, thriving ecological systems? Right? What does that actually mean when you try and implement it in a renewable energy project? Uh, so over these last few months, we've identified some of these pilots, and uh, my colleague Anna from uh, Forum will, will talk a bit more about this. Because these are not just goals that we should aspire for. These must become the way we will, uh, the way the sector grows. And these are actions that we should be able to show others uh, and how they can be implemented in scale. Um, you heard, again, Dr. Anapurna just briefly talk about SiteRight. This is one of those tools that can help uh, get the renewable energy sector uh, 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 to be located uh, in, in, in the more appropriate uh, uh, areas. I want to highlight three more points uh, before I close uh, that we must address collectively. Uh, the first is on the circularity uh, question, circularity in renewable energy systems and value chains. Uh, in renewable energy systems, when we use the word renewable, uh, that what we mean is the fuel. Only the fuel is renewable, uh, not the rest of the energy system. And we know already a significant number of materials and minerals uh, that are going to be needed for India's renewable energy growth as we think of going from where we are to 450 or 500 gigawatts. And then there's the issue of waste generated. After these products are used, uh, all of them have specific lifespans, um, and so the issue of, of waste, recycling, so on and so forth. Not just for solar panels and windmills, uh, but also for batteries and other storage technologies that will be needed to be deployed alongside for the energy transition to truly happen. Uh, so that is, a that is a sort of very important question. The second is an accountability and participatory governance. Um, now currently renewable energy projects are exempt from very basic environmental and social impact assessment regimes that apply to other energy projects, to, to other infrastructure projects. Now while this may have been necessary when the sector was in its nascent stage, um, perhaps this is the time for us to review it and to see if uh, the mature, at least the mature technologies that are around us, uh, those that have achieved grid parity and so on, uh, that it's a time for us to design and develop appropriate uh, regimes uh, to, um, to, to ensure we study these impacts. The advantage of an environmental impact assessment or social impact assessment or those types of tools is that it helps you identify upfront what potential impacts there may be and then you design ways to minimize it and mitigate it upfront, not wait for it to happen on the ground. Uh, also importantly, how can we create spaces and venues for people who are likely to be adversely impacted by these projects to be able to voice their concerns? Um, and finally, on distributive equity, um, how can we make sure there's fairness in the distribution of costs and benefits of the energy transition? Uh, specifically, how do we socialize the benefits but not the costs. Uh, so everyone should benefit from the energy transition, but the costs should not be disproportionately levied on the poor. Now these are important questions, and I, I know that we already have a sort of packed panel. Uh, I'm hoping that some of the panelists will, will focus or at least touch on these issues. Uh, today we have a galaxy of experts, um, and I'm pretty keen uh, for us to get on with that part. Uh, but let me use this opportunity to also invite uh, those who are sort of new to the Responsible Energy Initiative efforts 
and, and uh, just say that if you have ideas, you want to come on board, please let us know. Uh, we are very keen to expand and grow this uh, consortium, this, this collaboration. And I can also tell you that over the coming months, this is going to significantly gain prominence, um, including at, at the next COP28, uh, uh, because this, these are the issues of today. And as countries are transitioning to clean energy, transitioning to higher renewable energy, uh, we will need to get ahead of this. Um, and I, I'm really glad that in India, given you know India's uh, this coincidentally, uh, India's uh, sort of presidency of the G20 and the, the CEM and so on, um, that, that in India we also have a head start with the Responsible Energy Initiative. Um, and I hope uh, we can all collectively work together and, and create and support a, a responsible renewable energy sector. Thank you. Thank you, Bharat, for speaking more about what we mean by responsibility and responsible renewable energy. I also wanted to quickly add, uh, in May last year, we as a group um, launched what we call the vision and principles for responsible renewable energy. You might find a copy at the back at the registration desk. We had limited physical copies, but if you haven't had a copy, we'll make sure we'll send it to you over email. Please do read through uh, to see the vision that we have set for the sector together with about 30 organizations and what principles do we need to follow as the sector grows as well. Um, I would now like to invite the panelists for the first panel discussion. Um, I'm quite excited to welcome them. Um, I'd like to invite Ritu, Swami, Bhargavi, Puneet, Vivek, Subramaniam to the stage. Kirti, if you wanted to keep the name tags. Um, if you folks want to, uh, want to take your seats here, I'll quickly introduce uh, the moderator. Um, this panel discussion will explore the role of investment and finance, very important tool uh, in driving renewable energy and supporting the RE sector to set a benchmark in terms of the value it creates for everyone, beyond shareholders, beyond the immediate companies, for each and every citizen as well. Um, the panel will be moderated by Ritu Kumar, who is a senior director at TPG. Ritu has deep expertise in environmental economics, global ESG, and has donned many hats um, in the investment space through UNIDO, development finance institutions, global investment committees, and private equity firms. In the panel discussion today, in this particular panel, we might not have space for questions from the audience, um, but please feel free to reach out to them and speak to them afterwards over lunch. Thank you, uh, Saksham. Uh, thank you to Forum, to WRI, to the other Vasudeva Foundation and the other organizers. Um, not only for today, but for your patience over the last couple of years in uh, bringing this forum to life. Um, I know it's been a pretty long journey, uh, but I think it's worth it. Um, so thank you very much for that. And thank you for inviting me and, and the panelists we have today uh, to talk about how investment and ESG can work together to make this sector more responsible than it currently is. Uh, I'm not going to repeat what um, Anapurna and uh, Bharat have, have said because I think they've laid out some of the issues in a very clear and uh, succinct manner. I just want to say that, you know, my firm, TPG, which is a global private equity investor, uh, investing in different parts of the world, including the US, EU, India, Southeast Asia, we face the same issues. We are an impact investor. Uh, we, are, we have a $7 billion climate fund that we are deploying across the globe. And the issues that Bharat has mentioned today are pretty much common in almost every country. Uh, I, when I started working with TPG, realized that it's not just, you know, in the emerging markets or India that we face, you know, challenges on how to work any sector in a more responsible manner. We have the same issues in the US. We have a few investments in this sector, 
in the renewable energy sector there. And we have, you know, issues relating to community, uh, tensions with local communities um, who bear the brunt of uh, environmental impacts. But there are two challenges in this sector that I want to highlight, which have been referred to before, but which I think, to my mind, are really germane to the sustainability of the renewable energy sector. One of them is issues around supply chains. Um, you know, we know, especially in the solar sector, uh, which is growing so fast in India uh, and across the world, we know that there has been a lot of attention and focus on uh, supply chains and human rights issues and abuses. And a lot of this stems from the fact that, you know, the supply chain suppliers are based in China. Uh, and a lot of the modules come from China, the solar modules come from China, and the polysilicon comes, in the value chain comes from regions in the Xinjiang province, which have been targeted uh, by civil society organizations and others for human rights abuses, forced labor issues. And this has become a major, major issue across the world. Uh, governments have reacted in different ways. The U.S. has come up with a, with a regulation. They have banned imports from suppliers from China that have been exposed to forced labor. Uh, we have the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, that, that the ban is a is a is a penalty, but at the same time, the U.S. government has come out with the Inflation Reduction Act, which it provides an incentive for local manufacture. Uh, which is free from um, uh, human rights abuses, forced labor, etc. Uh, so that is one issue, which I think is also pertinent to India. Uh, you know, we have in India, we ha we are also sourcing from China, uh, but I think the challenge is how do we come up with alternative suppliers that are clean in this sense, not just green, but also clean in a in, you know in in the social sense. The other issue which, again, has been, uh, you know, uh, which Bharat has referred to is how do we make this transition just? And I think that is really, really important for India, you know. How do we ensure that nobody is left behind? Clean is not all, green is not always clean, is, is what I'm saying, you know. So we do, and Anapunda mentioned, you know, that some of the mi old mining sites should be rehabilitated and used for solar. But my question really, and, it, and this is something I'd like to ask all the panelists also to address as they make their comments, is how do we ensure that we don't create stranded assets, we don't create stranded workers? Because in this process of decarbonization, a lot of people are going to lose their jobs. You know, those who are working in the fossil fuel sector or in carbon intensive industries, they might be made redundant, they might lose jobs. So how do we re-engage and retrain them so that the transition becomes, the decarbonization transition is, is just and equitable? Uh, and these are, as I said, challenges that we are facing across uh, the different geographies that we work in. Um, so it's not just unique to India, but I think they are extremely important. So with that, I am going to ask, first of all, our panelists to please introduce themselves um, with just a quick remarks on you know, their backgrounds, what they're doing. And then I have a few questions that I would like to put to each of them. Uh, but maybe we can just start with, with, the, with the, my colleague at the end there, Shubha. Is that Shubha? Shubha? Yeah. yeah. Um, very good morning to all of you. and. Um, Apologies for the delay in arriving, but <clears throat> I am uh, Subramanyam Pulipaka. I am the CEO of uh, National Solar Energy Federation of India. Uh, we are India's largest umbrella body for uh, solar energy companies uh, and predominantly uh, uh, the policy advocacy body for representing India's uh, solar energy interests. We represent about 145 uh, solar companies throughout the value chain of uh, developers, manufacturers, system integrators, and overall they account to 95% of India's solar market. Uh, personally, uh, as a federation and uh, in my role as CEO, we have been uh, taking a lot of initiatives, uh, not only to address uh, just transition, but also 
making it more responsible. Um, and throughout the course of discussion, I'll be outlining some of them. Thank you, Ritu, and uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Vivek Adhya. Uh, work in the climate and sustainability practice at the Boston Consulting Group. I've been in this space over the last 18 years now, and you know my first uh, entrance into climate or sustainability came in from a responsible investment point of view, where you know I was managing a solid waste management plant for the city of Kolhapur and got carbon credits and got that investment to really set the path here. Uh, thank you again, Forum and uh, other partners, colleagues, for having me here, and we'll try and share the perspectives. We've been working very closely with a lot of investors on ESG, on responsible investing, so we'll try and share, share a few insights. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm Bhargavi. Yeah, I'm Bhargavi and I'm an independent researcher and educator. I'm also a trustee of a NGO called Environment Support Group in Bangalore. Uh, I come with a background in environmental science, botany, aerobiology, journalism, and I work at the intersection of community action with law and policy and governance. I've been following solar parks for the last one and a half decades. I've uh, be, uh, been watching the Pavagada solar park since its inception. And I've also been part of the fact-finding committee on the Mikirbamuni solar park in Assam. And I've also studied a couple of other solar parks, thanks to Saksham, Bharat, and others, because I've been part of this journey since its inception here, too. Probably have met many of you during a couple of meetings earlier. Happy to be here and share my thoughts. Thank you. Yep. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Nagasimha Swami. I'm the ESG manager at uh, BII, British International Investments, uh, for the South Asia region. So, uh, the interest for me here is uh, I work closely with uh, renewable uh, energy developers, uh, and uh, BII is a developmental financial institution of the UK government. So, the kind of standards what we expect from a renewable energy uh, developer are at times quite steep. That's how it has been seen, uh, given the uh, dilution or given the leniency what has been taken regulatory for the ENS standards for a renewable energy developer. So that's where uh, my work involves picking up with the, uh, uh, with the issues which have been kind of uh, set aside or not been looked into very seriously by the uh, renewable energy developers and making them aware and working along with them to achieve uh, the best-in-class standards, uh, which looks into all aspects of environment and the social uh, risks. So, and uh, with that uh, brief, uh, I would like to uh, put my two cents over here uh, through this panel. And thanks for uh, the, uh, the Responsible Energy Initiative for inviting me. Thanks. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, I am Puneet Prasthiki uh, from NIF. Uh, NIF uh, is an institutional investing platform anchored by the government of India and uh, other large institutional investors across the world. Uh, I lead the clean energy investments and digital infra investments for them. Um, so we've been actively involved in this sector, uh, you know, for since almost since our inception. Uh, and personally, you know, I've been kind of working in this sector for almost like 14, 15 years now, uh, since the National Solar Mission kind of came out. Um, and really look forward to this session, learning uh, from the fellow panelists and also sharing my insights. Thank you. So as you've seen, we have a nice mix of people with different backgrounds, um, you know, ESG investors and uh, Bhar 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 Bhargavi. Um, who's, uh, you know, from the civil society, government side. So I'm, I'm going to now just ask each of them a couple of questions, and hopefully there might be time for us to take a few questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to start with Swami. Swami, you know, his background is more on the sort of technical ESG side. Um, and given the, the topic of the day, um, I just want to ask Swami what in a, your experience, what has been the role, and, a, and an honest answer please, what has been the role of ESG professionals 
in uh, driving this agenda of responsible investing in renewable energy? You know, how do you see yourself interacting with your investment colleagues? Uh, and what sort of pushbacks do you face or what, you know, or not for that matter? Uh, thanks, Ritu, for that. Uh, just to set a bit of a context to this is that uh, World Economic Forum has, uh, in its latest report, 2023, has, uh, has, has allowed e ENS risk as the dominant risk, which is coming over the short term and uh, over the next 10 years. So that is the uh, context what we are looking at, and around two, uh, 2030 is where uh, we would be hitting some of the uh, tipping points where uh, reversing back from the climate impact would be impossible. And uh, given uh, the whole uh, responses towards the uh, addressing climate change and uh, the ENS assets which are going to hit around 53 trillion by 2025, I think that sets a very good background and a very good context and a reason for the ESG professionals here in this room to start acting or uh, start delivering on their uh, mission or on their passion what, for which they have picked up this field. Uh, having been in this field for the past 25 years, I have seen how ENS has evolved as a subject, as a risk, as an opportunity. So uh, early weather days when it was only EHS and then we moved on to sustainability and the whole bandwagon of uh, disclosures around sustainability reporting and then we had standards and now everything uh, is ESG. But the continued positioning of the Indian government uh, towards climate change response has been very overwhelming and that will shape the things to come and that will shape the policies, regulations as well as uh, the guidelines. So that creates a very good leverage which is required for the ESG professionals to start putting their thoughts into uh, proportionate risk-based implementable actions. So that's, that's where um, uh, ESG professionals should be uh, very happy to be in the current uh, scenario where it is backed up by the uh, India's or the government's whole policy and the thought process. So equally is the global moment uh, to address the climate change risk. And when it comes to the investment, yes, the fight uh, still continues, but you may not be required to fight the battles which I fought back because uh, the resistance has slowly reduced, the denial has, has been reduced to a greater extent and um, they also understand the plus points and the opportunity side of addressing climate change risk. And that's where uh, you are in a better position in this current scenario, wherein uh, you can deliver on your uh, passion. The other thing is uh, very important is to cut through the shades of green, which is very important because a lot of disclosures have come around and these disclosures are actually pushing companies or organizations to uh, pick up something which may not be the greenest or which may not actually address the whole life cycle risk of any given sector. So that's where cutting through the shades of green and addressing and looking at the business activity through its uh, uh, life cycle approach is a must. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Swami. So hope there and also a word of caution about greenwashing because there's a lot of that happening as well as we know. So thank you for that. So let me now ask to, uh, turn to an investor, to Puneet. Um, so, you know, what from, just from a purely investment perspective, um, what do you think is the main challenge that you in NIF or just generally face in ensuring that, you know, the, the returns that they get, which, is, which are very attractive now, the returns from investing in renewable energy, are also balanced by uh, doing it in a responsible manner. What are the key challenges you face? Having heard, of, heard about what Swami had just said as well. See, I think, <clears throat> interestingly, I think when we were, you know, when we were setting up NIF, uh, ESG was one of the, like, 
we kind of, you know, consciously decided that ESG is going to be one of the cornerstones of the institution. Uh, so, you know, in terms of our philosophy, I think we've always kept it front and center. I think the key challenge and, you know, it's, it's also been a perception that some of these things, you know, when you try to do them responsibly cost a lot, they actually don't. You know, if, if you were to kind of just look at this purely on a return basis, it's not a lot of money. Yes, you know, and I'll come to the one of the points, you know, which was raised earlier by you, uh, Ritu, on the supply chain, which is a more fundamental, I would say, industry-wide issue, and it, it would take uh, more than for, you know, someone like us, or, you know, it, it's a more collective effort, which, which would be required to kind of mitigate that piece. But otherwise, you know, just kind of doing this, you know, uh, either at the community level or any of the other things, I don't see a lot of challenge. The other piece is more a attitude change. You know, a lot of these people, you know, at our platforms uh, are really people who've, who've had this mindset of infrastructure development. For them, ESG is still a more tick in the box. I think embedding that culture has been, you know, to some extent, uh, you know, been a challenge. It, it takes time, you know, for them to kind of think about that more subconsciously. Uh, till now, it's been more a compliance activity, you know, okay, this is what needs to be done. But really, you know, kind of looking at it in that sense that, okay, safety does matter, okay, or we need to, you know, ensure that this thing needs to be done in the right manner you know, taking care of the biodiversity, you know, for any local site or any of those things. So it's taken time, but it's getting there. Uh, the supply chain, of course, has been a big challenge. Uh, and, uh, you know, to be honest, I don't think it's going to get solved, uh, at least in the next five, seven years. Uh, there is a very, very large dependence on China. I think all of us can claim that we can essentially mitigate this issue, but uh, globally, you know, uh, just from the polysilicon refining piece of itself, you know, 80-85% of the market is controlled by China. So you can make everything else out there in the supply chain, but the polysilicon is going to come from those places. The government has been doing a lot. Uh, the PLI initiative, uh, the production link incentive is one step in that action. Uh, it's going to take some time to fructify that on the ground. Uh, but uh, it's still some years away. Right. So can, can I just follow up on, on that issue? You mentioned briefly that, you know, the sector needs to work together to address this, I think, a very important issue. Are there any initi initiatives in India that have started, you know, sector-wide? Uh, and maybe, you know, the um, uh, colleagues from the Solar Federation can also address this when we come to you. But you know, is there is there any activity now that is? I'm not talking about government uh, intervention, but just as a sector, voluntary initiatives that can be promoted. So see, it's still uh, you know uh, there is of course a collective effort uh, you know around the Solar Power <coughs> Developers Association, uh, which is a collective of all the developers which are trying to work through this issue. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been, uh, it's, it's been difficult to kind of transition. Uh, one possible solution has been at least to partly mitigate by setting up facilities in India for the local manufacturing, for the domestic manufacturing, but that's still all only, you know, with cells and modules. Uh, as I suggested, right, the polysilicon refining, the way for manufacturing, still continues to be something where we are dependent on China. Uh, the next few years, some of the larger players in the country today are taking up those things. Hopefully in the next three to four years, we will see some integration, uh, you know, from a supply chain perspective uh, within India itself. Let me then actually ask uh, um, uh, Prabhu uh, to maybe address that question and then I'll ask uh, a couple of others. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, building on um, what uh, Mr. Rustagi said, uh, <coughs> I think uh, for any sector, um, if you look at it, 
the policy and the implementation part evolves as the sector grows. Uh, Ten years before, our install capacity was less than 1.5 gigawatt. Today, we are sitting at 64.2 gigawatt. And if things go well, one year from now, I'll cross 80 gigawatt. So this 80 gigawatt of installations have taught us a lot on how we face these challenges when we go on ground. Starting from the supply chain issues, uh, if I start addressing one by one, uh, there was a point where we were the third largest exporter of uh, modules and cells. Today, we are the largest importer. Uh, we have less than 1% of uh, cell manufacturing in the world and less than 1.5% of module manufacturing in the world. But now PLI is in uh, place, and uh, if things go right uh, with both PLIs, uh, we are projected to add at least 65 gigawatt of uh, direct module manufacturing capacity end to end from cell, wafer, ingot, and polysilicon by the end of 2025, 2026. So this is a good step uh, towards uh, achieving self-reliance, sustainability, as well as decreasing our uh, import dependency while leading to our energy security. But on the implementation side, when we look at it, it has always been a road filled with challenges. I don't need to introduce the concept of or the story of the Great Indian Bus Ride to the crowd. And if, if you don't know about it, uh, then it's all over the news. You can go and read it. We spent almost three years. Uh, I personally feel I am more uh, attached to the bird than I'm attached to the sector now. So these are the kind of things that you encounter during the course of implementation. And as a responsible, and I emphasize the word responsible uh, sector, we are reacting to it uh, in a sustainable way and in a way that is not uh, compromising on either of the aspects. It's not nature or development, it's both. So that is one aspect that uh, we are looking at. The second one which I want to especially emphasize on and uh, until a couple of years back, this was under the wraps. Now we are seeing a lot of prominence being given to it, is on the land uh, issues. Uh, India's, uh, India is a land of opportunity, pun intended. But for us, in the solar sector, uh, after we, I won't say, I don't use the word uh, used or overused the land that is uh, existing for which is arid and which is existing for projects, now we are starting to face the land issues in the country. So the concept of co-locating solar generation with agriculture is something that is slowly gaining prominence. On one hand, uh, it might be looked upon as you have an agriculture land and you use it to have solar and it becomes viable, the land use ratio is good and your land issue is solved. The farmer issues are solved. Uh, they are part and parcel of your fight against climate change. On the other hand, you have an arid land, you have a land which is uncultivable before, and now you are using that to, you know, not grow food crops or other crops, but at least the ornamental crops. So this is, a, in my opinion, a paradigm shift uh, from where we uh, started, how we saw solar energy as a generation source, and how we are seeing it now. Uh, it is both a coincidence and uh, I would say on a different uh, set of expectations, our emphasis has always been more on the utility scale and large scale plants, uh, while the very virtue of solar is distributed and it can be produced where you're consuming. But on the utility scale side, I think this is what uh, we are trying to address. Uh, I chair the working group of uh, renewables and agriculture in IRENA Coalition for Action. And around 38 countries have now come together to pledge for it. Our own ministry has formed a working committee on agriculture issues. So yeah, from the supply chain side, uh, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, better late than never. Uh, but uh, on the implementation side, I do see uh, rays of hope, literally and figuratively. Yeah, that's good to hear. But before I let you go, maybe you know, given your background in the sort of developer side of the business, what is it that you think that developers need from investors like Puneet? 
to, to sort of mainstream responsibility, energy investment? I mean, a direct answer for that would be they don't need technically anything more. Already in the framework of the investment infrastructure that is there, including NIS, it is mandatory. And uh, to begin with, uh, any... Uh, yeah, can I just qualify my question? Yeah. So NIF, you know, are, are sort of probably leaders in this, but, um, you know, other investors who are not thinking about it so seriously. Sure, sure. So by and large, uh, fortunately, most of the investors are thinking about it. But uh, when I see... Uh, the trend of uh, investment coming into India. Uh, renewables is a 100% FDI sector. Uh, we have had a healthy mix of institutional investors, sovereign funds, uh, in indigenous funds from different countries, including India there. More or less, most of them did uh, uh, have, if not a, you know, generic, but a very strict framework for these things. But uh, uh, coming of the age, I think, uh, if uh, it can be in integrated more into the value of uh, the returns that they come that come from the projects that is one way i look at uh, from the investors perspective again i am all for investors uh, uh, not giving a free hand to developers and developers strictly strictly adhering to investor uh, uh, framework and guidelines but there's a healthy uh, Pattern, I should say, in the last four years. I, after, uh, I mean, I categorized the discussion on responsible renewable energy in two timelines. One is before GIB and one is after GIB. So, before GIB, the narrative was mostly on okay, solar is there, it itself is sustainable, you are contributing to the carbon uh, mitigation, climate change mitigation. Now, post GIB, now there are additional checks and balances that are there in the investing ecosystem that they are there. And uh, that is good uh, for the sector, not only for solar, now I'm looking at, uh, you know, the budget has uh, given a green light for pumped hydro policy, uh, gigawatt scale storage projects. So all of them will definitely fall under this ambit and you cannot take solar from this picture away. Thank you, thank you, Subha. Um, Vivek, um, what do you think from your perspective, you know, you're now with BCG, you've had uh, plenty of, uh, you know, many years of experience working in this field. Um, what do you think are some of the bottlenecks in mobilizing capital? Uh, not so much in, in sort of deploying it, but in mobilizing capital towards not just renewable energy, but responsible renewable energy investment. No, of course, I think, uh, <coughs> I'll, I'll build up from what my co-panelists suggested. Uh, you know, I think there are still a few bottlenecks and that's why, you know, we were asking these questions in the morning and, and what we are looking at today. Uh, if we just zoom back a little bit, you know, money started becoming greener mostly after the Paris Agreement and, you know, everybody was trying to say, okay, maybe there is a need for transition finance and we need to move out and invest into more greener ways of producing energy, using energy, consuming stuff and all. And this kept happening across the board, both from a policy context and a private investor point of view. And suddenly you see a plethora of all kinds of pledges and platforms and movements coming out, uh, including say the science-based targets for uh, financial institutions or the net zero banking alliance or GFANS, you, you name it, everything's out there. What all of these things have done is they have really focused more on rehashing the portfolio uh, in a way that, okay, maybe we'll take targets by, say, 2025, we'll not invest in coal. By 2027, we'll not invest in oil and gas. And maybe by 2030, we'll not do chemicals and stuff. But for all of these initiatives, investing into RE and uh, renewable energy became more like a benign solution where we said, okay, maybe we'll have a lesser uh, burden or a lesser devil at play if we you know, channelize all the investments here. But that's where the, the missing out of the environmental and social impacts of RE came in. 
And, and this is the first bottleneck which I wanted to highlight, which is the awareness part. You know, everybody has their own frameworks and due diligence criteria and, you know, uh, you know different ways to, to make investments, but the social and environmental impacts of RE are not there. People are not aware. They still feel investing into RE is like a, a lesser devil benign solution. So there is work that needs to be done in creating that awareness and the responsible RE initiative uh, is, is doing that. Uh, what this also you know, translates it into is there are so many complex uh, you know, framings and mechanisms and you, you look at ESG, there are hundreds of ratings and frameworks and you know, uh, disclosure guidelines and there are independent agencies who do all of this. So for an investor, how do you really tackle these different aspects, right? People are just doing their own solutions, their own structure, their own uh, methods because, you know, probably the what's available off the shelf doesn't work. So when you do these frameworks, how do you simplify across the board? How do you make it a little more, uh, uh, you know, uh, harmon harmonizing, uh, if I can say, to, to cover some of these environmental and social aspects of it. But then the third bottleneck is the lack of data and the context, right? We, we heard in the morning as well, what does it really mean to, to really make responsible our investments? You know, is it the land use change which he was talking about? You know, we just probably never thought that we'll run out of land for the renewable energy investment. So is that a, a, a con conflict? Is there a context to that? Is there a data point for, for some of those aspects? So how do you bring in more of that data contextual aspects of it? And then really look at you know, the balance between short-termism and the longer-term goal. Because sometimes including these additional nuances, getting more social impact assessments done, environmental impact assessments done, probably excluding a few projects will not reflect into uh, short-term gains and benefits, right? So how do you move away from that mindset to a more longer-term vision? And that's the third, uh, that's the fourth kind of bottleneck which, which we were looking at. So yeah, this is, this is what we've been experiencing and I hope it kind of brings a perspective. Yeah, I mean, harmonization is always a challenge, I think, not just for this sector. I mean, we've been seeing it for decades now, you know, how do you harmonize standards across the board? Um, that is a big challenge. But I want to turn to Bhargavi now. Sorry, Bhargavi, you've been quiet so far, but that's not because we don't want to hear what you have to say. I think you have, you have great experience in sort of the intersection of law, governance, policy. So I'd like to hear from your vantage point, uh, you know, working with civil society and holding large financial institutions, including DFIs like BII to account. Uh, you know, what do you think needs to shift in the way investing happens uh, in this sector? Um, and I'd, I'd like you to maybe just think a little bit about how we can make this transition more just from a societal point of view. Uh, thank you. So, uh, first of all, I think we all need to go back to the fact that uh, RE projects had been removed from the purview of uh, environmental clearings and EIAs. This was challenged way back in 2012 uh, at the National Green Tribunal, and the National Green Tribunal uh, directed uh, the MOEF and CC to revisit that decision. But that has not been done, so that needs to be pushed, and we need to get RE projects back in the purview of EC and EIAs. Because that is the only way that uh, it is open to public review. Uh, without public review, I think these projects are not going to be viable in the long run. Uh, the next thing is I think we need to make sure uh, local communities are part of it, because uh, we spoke about land. Although we have the 2013 uh, LAR Act, everywhere land is being taken under lease or uh, local state laws, uh, land laws were reformed to uh, aid RE projects. And that has not been fair on local communities. So we need to give people an option 
uh, of the LAR Act so that if they want to sell and resettle, then it's a fair process. The third thing is about the siting of the projects itself. Most of the projects where uh, RE projects have come up are areas which are already very low in all the indicators. Take Pavagada, for instance. Take Kopal, for instance. The next project, big project that's coming up is in Kopal. It's already way down in the global hun hunger index and maternal mortality, infant mortality, all of that. And we are pushing this community into deep intergenerational poverty because the lease amount of 21,000 rupees per acre per annum is not going to sustain these communities. There is no food at the household level. Girl children are being pulled out of school. Child marriage is happening. Human trafficking has started in these areas. And that again is going to bear the brunt on the girl child because she's not ready for a reproductive life cycle and we're going to have long-term issues of infant mortality and maternal mortality. So we need to think on those terms. And we also need to ensure that we are not installing RE projects in the commons. Pavagada, Reva, wherever you go, you see that most of the commons have been appropriated. Uh, it is sitting on lake beds, it is sitting on river beds, it is sitting on grazing pastures, and this has displaced local livelihoods. And these are communities who have no other alternatives. It is the agro-pastoral livelihoods. So now in the process of um, saying no to coal and installing RE, the north and the northeast of India, we're gonna have a bunch of communities who will be pushed out of coal and in the south and the southwest, we're going to have another bunch of people who are going to be pushed out of their livelihoods because of RE. And we don't have an alternate plan in place for them. And looking at the skills, there are very few skill uh, building centers across the country. Most of the Vayu Mitra, Varun Mitra projects are happening in cities and they're not accessible to rural people. And look at the employment itself. Pavagada, which originally had some 4,000 people working there today has some 1,500 people, of which only 800 are on a permanent payroll. So the RE sector doesn't really um, create so many permanent jobs. So we need to look at um, those aspects as well. And public review, like I said, is very important because it is only then that we can fix the uh, nuts and bolts of the entire thing. And the last thing I would like to say is, uh, it has to be in consonance with the public trust doctrine, the intergenerational uh, principle, uh, e equity principle, then the precautionary principle, all those uh, pub uh, you know, principles of environmental uh, jurisprudence uh, have to be borne in mind. And uh, financiers have to do some due diligence at the land level, at the community level, uh, because that is very, very important. And uh, non-conventional energy is a subject of the panchayats. The 11th and the 12th schedules very clearly mention that, but unfortunately, local governments have been kept out of this entire process. We've created parastatals, and parastatals cannot be held accountable at all. So the entire public consultation processes happen online and very tokenistic. So local governments have no say in the matter. And this is a subject of the local government. So we have to bring them on board. Only when you know all these boxes are ticked, I think uh, it is going to be a good and a fair transition. And given that what the country woke up to the Adani scandal, I think we have to be very, very cautious. And uh, probably many of you are already aware that there is a Columbia University study which shows that uh, solar irradiation is going to reduce in the southwest uh, Indian belt. So if we are investing so much money there, what's going to happen to that? If we are not going to uh, be able to uh, make that much amount of energy, will it be another project where, you know, a few years back, in the name of uh, Jatropa uh, biofuels, so much of money was invested and so much saplings and other things were grown on... Uh, 
people's uh, farming lands and one fine day they just shut shop and they all move to Africa. Are we going to do that with this as well? So these are questions that need to be answered and I uh, also think that financiers, developers need to engage with civil society, local civil society, academia, local community and local governments. Only when everybody come to the table, we'll be able to uh, make this a just and a fair transition. Thank you. Thank you, Margavi, for those very, very sobering comments, I think, you know, brings us back to uh, reality. Uh, Puneet, can I ask you to, if possible, to respond to the challenges that Bhargavi has laid out? Sure. Yeah, no, no, I, I think so, uh, some of them are valid challenges. Uh, you know, and uh, there are no, there are no perfect answers for these. Uh, some of these situations will continue to evolve. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, today, uh, yes, you know, the consultations may happen on a limited basis, you know, some of these things continue to happen, uh, but, uh, you know, I think it's still still like a, it's an evolving situation. You know, still, I, I think it's an evolving situation. We are trying to kind of work on some of these issues through community development programs and ensuring that, you know, most of our projects, at least whatever semi-skilled jobs are there, are going to the local public today. And, you know, while some of these issues may appear to be social, uh, you know, for any developer or a financier or an investor, these are also fundamental business continuity risk. That wherever the local community is not really, you know, in sync with what's happening at the project level, you will see regular recurring thefts, you know, of things, you know, people take away modules, people take away wires, all of those things keep happening. So, it anyways needs to be a very ecosystem driven approach. Uh, I think most developers recognize that today. Uh, and that's why I think it's, it's important that, you know, while one lens is there of the social angle, it's a, it's a very integral business continuity risk which you are seeing, right? Uh, uh, and people are recognizing that today. Um, on the land side, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, the yes, the numbers can change. Today, it's it's more a willing buyer, willing seller basis. Uh, you know, the transaction take place. You know, it's it's dependent upon you know some land aggregator who's supporting you uh, through some of these processes. Um, and yes, I, my my sense is you know things are going to improve gradually as people become more and more aware about these things. Uh, uh, so I think that's where we are. Bhargavi, do, do you have any examples of, uh, you know, good practice, maybe not just across the world as well? I mean, you mentioned the work that has been done uh, in the U.S., but, you know, are there examples that we could learn from? Uh, because it is a slow process. I don't think we have the time to sort of, you know, uh, we don't have the luxury of time, to be honest. And the kind of things that you have raised are, are deep-rooted. Uh, so I don't know if you can share some examples of good practice that... Uh... Yeah, I think there are enough uh, examples from Europe where uh, agro-pastoral livelihoods coexist with this. And it's also very important uh, we ensure uh, water security and, uh, you know, ensure uh, soil protection. Because once the landscape is leveled, uh, it is going to harden the soil and in a least period of 28, 30 years, that soil is going to completely degrade. So we need to take precautions for that. I am told that the Kusum project of, offered by the government is doing pretty well in some areas. So that could be a good example because apparently the microclimate created by the horticultural uh, plants growing in and around the solar panels creates... Uh, efficiency for the panel itself, and that microclimate is also good for the horticulture plants and the harvest is good. So maybe those are uh, little things that we could uh, um, try and see if it can be implemented. And with respect to uh, 
land that has been taken away from the pastoral community, I think we need to find ways to, you know, give them some kind of ID cards and checks and balances to ensure that there are no petty thefts and safety issues. Uh, there have been a lot of accidents in all these areas, Pavagada, Reva, and all of them. Uh, so we need to ensure some safety, at the same time ensure these livelihoods can coexist. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, at least there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel, I suppose. Uh, just switching gears a bit, uh, and then maybe we, uh, after this we can open up for questions, if there are any from the audience. I just wanted to ask um, Vivek, uh, you know, do you think there is a, in some sort of bottleneck or, or, you know, in innovation in the financial sector? Uh, you referred to this briefly, so just please expand on that. That prevents the RE sector from achieving scale, uh, you know, in, and especially taking into consideration the kind of issues Bhargavi has raised. Right. No, I think uh, uh, there is, you know, there is hope, and I'll probably add in terms of how that bottleneck in the financial sector can be looked at to drive really scalable, responsible RE solutions. And, uh, you know, so, so should we be thinking of like a JETP, Just Energy Transitions Partnership equivalent, you know, kind of a, a platform, or should we be looking at some kind of a you know, India's presidency is there for G20, so maybe a G20 fund on, on responsible investments or something. But, you know, these are all wish list kind of solutions. Uh, what, what I'm really seeing on ground is how uh, uh, programs are being designed to, to take this into consideration. So, for example, uh, when you look at any of the uh, grid, uh, you know, connected RE solutions, it's usually at a place which is far off and you know, uh, it's uh, affecting the indigenous communities or, you know, people who do not have uh, uh, much access. But then the power which is generated is transferred back to the cities or some other places. And, and the very people whose land or livelihoods have been displaced, they do not have access to those kind of uh, measures. So what uh, Nepal is doing, for example, is, you know, uh, with a terrain like Nepal where you have different pockets which are not connected to the grid and, you know, they always kind of keep breaking down. They've been designing programs where they engage with uh, a literal sense of sweat equity where they look at the indigenous people, they bring in the local communities, involve them into the projects, make them as equity partners, get the labor and livelihoods coming out of that, and plus they have a share on the power that's been generated and stuff. So these kind of innovations really work well. There are a lot of blended finance facilities coming up from World Bank and the likes. So you know these also have their own set of environmental and social criteria to be met and stuff. So yeah. If I may add, uh, uh, we have. Uh, I mean, I agree mostly with uh, the conflicts and <clears throat> the situation on ground uh, that was outlined here. And uh, as an industry body, we are privy to some of them. So to address them effectively, uh, 22nd of this month, uh, we are launching uh, India Agri PV Alliance uh, here in Delhi. So this is an alliance that is consisting of not only the solar developers or manufacturers, but the farmers, civil societies, local communities, uh, finance institutions, NBFCs, cooperatives, and the local governments. So we are dedicatedly forming a working committee under this alliance that will uh, study the impact of uh, renewables uh, in the local communities and the aspect of inclusivity in, in the sector. Because we are a very strong proponent that uh, solar energy uh, in general, in specific and renewables in general, have the potential to uplift the socio-economic conditions. Uh, if they are doing otherwise, then we are not doing it right. So what is the situation on ground is privy to us. How to address it? We need minds to come together. That's a suggestion we also got that civil societies and local communities should also be involved. So we are trying to address that. In the first year, we are going to shortlist two states and shortlist specific regions in these states and then do a deep dive approach into these regions and then come up with solutions. The intent is very clear. From top to bottom, 
from the government side, from the association side, from the industry side, everything is clear. It's just that by the time the information passes from the grassroots to the top, we are either losing time, resources, or efforts. That is something that we are trying to address. That's very good to hear. And I think speed is the of the essence here. So, Swami, do you have any comments to make on sort of some of the social aspects before we open up for questions? Yeah. Uh, that's right. Because so some of our investments, uh, where uh, BI has invested with uh, the local developers, we have been putting up skill development centers, and the focus of the skill development centers is to uh, impart uh, new skills to the local unemployed youths and uh, also with an equal focus of involving women from that region. But we have had our same, uh, we have had our experiences where uh, culturally it has been difficult, especially in states like Rajasthan or even Anandpur where we could not attract uh, enough women to come and participate. But we have been working on that. Yes, thank you. I saw one hand raised over there. so. My name is Infrid Damm from GLZ, the German Development Corporation, and I have basically two questions. One thing, please follow me. My math gives me that we need about 50 gigawatts of additional renewables per year. And if you add green hydrogen and phasing down or even out of coal, we might need even 100 gigawatt renewable every year additionally. Would you follow this calculation to achieve Indian's goals of 500 gigawatt non-fossil? And if that is the case, we have to really scale up our, all our joint efforts to achieve that. And it's required to get there to come up later on to 2070 decarbonization. And while talking about the social impact, why don't we talk a little bit more straight on what have been the worst case things we experienced and what are the best practice examples which are out, and then learn from the best practice example and be cautious about the worst things which happen to avoid those things. And I think we need to be a little bit more frank in speaking out of those things. So these are my two questions. Yeah, no, I, I can react to some of those things. Uh, yes, the numbers, you know, are, if not exactly those, but of course in that magnitude. Uh, you know, at least uh, to just read the government's uh, target for 2030, we require at least 50, 60 gigawatts every year, uh, you know, from here on. Um, it's a large number. And, uh, you know, uh, even if we were to kind of, you know, let's say achieve 50% of that number, you know, given where we are today, I think it will really need we will really need to recalibrate ourselves the way we are thinking about it. Uh, that's quite the reality. I think everyone, uh, you know, in the industry recognizes that. Uh, just in terms of, uh, see, the best practices or anything. Uh, uh, two, three things, uh, you know, have become, I think, uh, increasingly visible where at least people are trying to actively work and where it makes economic sense as well. Uh, because the industry also sees this as a business continuity. In a ESG or environmental social perspective, one thing has been the water conservation piece. So people are transitioning, uh, you know, all the developers are transitioning from water-based cleaning solutions to robotic waterless solutions, you know, and that's, that's one of the key uh, changes which you see across the industry. Uh, the other piece uh, has been around, uh, you know, kind of uh, providing or, you know, providing adequate uh, watering, uh, you know, in terms of doing the hydrology studies and everything from a drainage system design and everything so that there is less flooding. And uh, Bhargavi was talking about one example where there was actually recently a massive, massive flooding which happened in that location in that solar park, but 
most people recognize that because they're also losing generation. You know, it's being cached also, it is being lost. So while the motivation may be slightly different for the developers, they do recognize these things and they are working towards addressing these things. Uh, yeah, I also thought uh, uh, we need to increase uh, rooftop. The focus has to be on rooftop because uh, living in Bangalore, the fact that all the energy comes all the way from Pavagada to Bangalore, while the villages in Pavagada themselves lurk in darkness. And uh, the irony of the whole thing is, you know, there are villages where you see women carrying firewood while they have a cart left behind in their backyard. So, like Ritu mentioned, unless uh, we, we ensure everybody has access to energy, uh, we will not be, uh, you know, doing a fair transition. The second thing is um, CSR money needs to go back into these villages. Uh, at least all those developers who are in places like Reva, Pavagata, and all of that, their CSR has to go back there. Uh, that's when it will help the local communities to a large extent. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, I can see a few hands. I've been told we are almost out of time, so maybe we take one more question uh, uh, from the gentleman at the back there. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, my name is Kapil Nolo. I'm with the uh, UI and UPIO. My question is very simple. If we look that this is the ideal we want to reach, where are we at the moment in terms of ESG? In respect of various projects, if you average them all, what would be your estimate that we are at 10%, 20%, 30% or the range? As Jerry and I can say, my personal view is we are at 30%. But <laughs> and maybe that's a good way to end this session. Subo, how much percent? 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, uh, but with that, I just want to thank the panel. Uh, good session. Thank you so much, everybody, for your very thoughtful interventions. And let's hope that we get where we want to get to become 100. But I don't know in how much time. But thank you so much. <laughs>